Hello, BookTube. Well, I have a little mail for you today on an absolutely gorgeous, warm, bright, sunny springtime Saturday. Uh, but it's a quite different day than it was yesterday. <laughs> oh, my. Yesterday, for those of you who are not watching every video, I had a rotten day. It started off great. Then it went rotten. And it went rotten with a vengeance. Uh, so that I had to do an emergency Steve stream, an emergency live stream, just to pick myself up a little. And that did work. Thanks to all of you who were showed up for the live stream. Uh, and then I realized the only way to capitalize on that momentum is to unbox surefire remedies to rotten days. Uh, and there's nothing weird or, or mysterious or unknown about those remedies. They have stood me in good stead for a very, very, very long time. Um, the, the, they take... It's a remedy that has three ingredients. A closed and locked door, at least one sleeping dog, and a pile of books. <laughs> and that I did that last night uh, all night long until, until Rosy Finger Dawn was coming up over the ridge. I did that all night long, and the problems of the day melted away. <laughs> they melted away. The, the minute... I don't know when it was exactly, probably around two or three in the morning when it's when the room started to get chilly. It started to shake off uh, the the weight of the day's heat, uh, which I'm talking about in the final days of October in Boston. I'm talking about the weight of the day's heat. I'm talking about getting my errands done before the heat of the day really builds in. I have put my winter clothes in a plastic hamper. <laughs> I've, I've washed them and rolled and folded them and put them away. I've put them in storage because we're not going to have any winter weather. Um, I can't remember the last time I went out in, in with any anything other than my shirt sleeves. I think it was when David Murphy was here. Uh, but otherwise, it's been a month. My automated weather alerts are full of red warnings about how since it hasn't rained in Massachusetts in well over 10 years, we are incredibly prone. First of all, we're in an incredible drought, but also we're incredibly prone to wildfires. No different than the West Coast. They're, they're, everything here is tinderbox dry. Uh, so a lightning strike uh, out of a clear blue sky or a, a one dropped match or something like that, could cause a conflagration that would cost a lot of people their homes. Not the sort of thing you used to think about in Massachusetts. But then again, the way we used to think about Massachusetts, we would already have had a, a killing frost and also a dusting of snow by now. When it is clear that we are not going to have a frost this winter at all, not much as a deep frost, and that it's not going to snow here at all. Snow might be in the air for one day that every bubble-headed bleach blonde in the news comments on, but there will be no snow in the sense of snow coating things and accumulating on roofs and whatnot. Uh, I walk around when I'm, when I'm out walking with the bean. I walk around and I see all these New England houses with the sharp triangular gables and rooftops and whatnot all built that way because you don't want them accumulating the weight of snow in the winter. You want them to shed snow in the winter. Uh, just a, a sure architectural signs that the climate in this part of the world was once very different. Uh, but, but what was, what was the point of that? Oh, right. Uh, it was, it was a beautiful day. And also I was right in my hopeful predictions yesterday. I was right that all the people who were nicking and pitting at me yesterday, wanting a little bit here and there, when I was yelling at one point, I am working. I am not involved in the work you're doing. I'm paying you. That's all. I'm not helping you. All those people are gone today. They are all gone. They are do they're all doing something else. So I don't know if they'll be back on Monday, but Monday can worry about itself. I have today, and today has been pure bliss. Uh, because I figured that if uh, cuddling next to a cute little dog, there's a cute little dog cuddled next to me right now, <laughs> that if cuddling next to a cute little dog uh, and just maxing out on reading worked really well for seven or eight hours last night, then maybe it would work for seven or eight hours today, and it did, as I am overdosing on, on the things that make me feel good, and it's working. Uh, so I just wanted I wanted to preface this. It's just a quick mail haul. It's just a couple of packages, but I wanted to preface this, uh, this ongoing psychodrama of this channel by letting you know that I'm no longer having a bad day. <laughs> you were all very kind 
about that, both in emails and also for showing up for that live stream. You were all very kind. You were all very nice about it. But I, uh, I read my way out of it. I cuddled with Frida my way out of it. And that bad day is taking the weekend off. <laughs> so that's great. I, I'll be all ready on Monday to do battle again. <laughs> we will see. But in the meantime, let's look at these packages. There's no boxes. There's one uh, smaller package and one larger package. And the larger package looks like it was hand addressed instead of a printed envelope, a printed address. So it may be from one of you. Uh, we'll do the first one first, though. Oh. Okay, the first one is two books. Uh, great. Uh, what have we got here? Oh, all right. Well, the first one is something that we've seen already. So this is a double. This comes out in early January. And it's by Paul Strathern, who's, who's really enjoyable to read. And it is Dark Brilliance, The Age of Reason from Descartes to Peter the Great. Uh, with a little help from the other guy on that cover. <laughs> it's just a tiny bit of help from, uh, from the greatest scientific mind in the history of humanity. <laughs> uh, let's see here. During the 1600s, between the end of the Renaissance and the start of the Enlightenment, Europe lived through an era known as the Age of Reason. This was a revolutionary period that saw great advances in age in areas such as art, science, philosophy, political theory, and economics. However, all this was accomplished against a background of extreme political turbulence on a continental scale in the form of internal conflicts and international wars. Indeed, the Age of Reason itself was born at the same time as the Thirty Years' War, which would devastate Central Europe to an extent that would not be seen again until World War I. This period also saw the development of European empires across the world, as well as a lucrative new transatlantic commerce that brought transformative riches to Western society. However, there was a dark underside to this brilliant wealth. It depended on human slavery. By exploring all the key events and bringing to life some of the most influential characters in the era, including Caravaggio, Rembrandt, Newton, Descartes, Spinoza, Louis XIV, and Charles I, Historian Paul Strathern tells the vivid story of this paradoxical age while also exploring the painful cost of creating the progress and modernity on which the Western world was built. Uh, this, is, this is a double, but it sounded great the first time, and it still sounds great. I'm not going to be getting to it because it's next year. But uh, And then what is this next one? Oh, also from uh, the folks at Pegasus. So this is uh, this comes out in March. This is by Violet Moeller. And it is called Inside the Stargazer's Palace, the Transformation of Science in 16th Century Europe. So these are very much of a kin here. Uh, enter the mysterious world of 16th century science, where astronomers and alchemists shared laboratories. In 1543, Nicholas Copernicus declared the Earth revolved around the sun, overturning centuries of scholastic presumption. A new age was coming into view, one guided by observation, technology, and logic. But omens and elixirs did not disappear from the 16th century laboratory. Charms and potions could still be found nestled between glistening brass instruments and leather-bound tomes. The lines between the natural and supernatural remained porous, yet to be defined. From the icy Danish observatory of Tycho Brahe to the sulfur-stained workshop of John Dee, the author tours the intellectual heart of early European science, exploring its rich, multidisciplinary culture this book reveals a dazzling forgotten world where all knowledge, no matter how arcane, could be pursued in good faith. Okay, well, uh, I worry about it. I worry about books like this. Uh, this what we've seen on this channel. This is not the first time we've encountered a book like this. I, uh, is the author a historian? Yeah, she's an award-winning, acclaimed historian who's written four previous books. So maybe we'll be in good hands. Uh, I worry about this because there's no such thing as arcane knowledge. There's knowledge and then there's ignorance. There's science, and then there's superstition. There is no magic. Alchemy doesn't work. There is no magic. It's not uh, that all of these things, where all knowledge, no matter how arcane, could be pursued in good faith. It's that some of this was knowledge, and other, and other parts of it was not. And modern books are not saying that. Modern histories of magic are describing the history of something that exists instead of the history of something that is a cultural phenomenon. Magic doesn't exist. So if you're a historian and you're exploring the nature of the, the history of something, that of just not just, I'm not writing a history of 
Italian traditions with conjuring spells for demons. I'm writing a history of conjuring spells for demons. How effective were they in the 12th century? Were they more or less effective than they were in the 16th century? How, how, are, how are you doing that conjuring spell? What do you find is effective? Eye of Newt? Uh, tongue of Toad? The quiet assumption, the quiet presupposition behind the prose being that, that conjuring spells for demons are real. <laughs> they aren't. And arcane knowledge is not real. Alchemy is not real. This, what, this, what the science of the 16th century was, was the slow, agonizing replacement of the gigantic bricolage of cultural ignorance with actual, testable, repeatable, observable science. Stuff that was real. Stuff that could be demonstrated to be real. Stuff that worked. Uh, and I'm, I, I worry from, again, it's just the pub sheet. It's not the book. So we don't know what the book will be like until next year. Uh, but I worry that the book is not going to say that. Um, I guess for fear of offending someone's ethnic culture or whatnot. I, I have no idea what the reason would be why I read academic histories that do not say that magic is not real. That instead say, well, magic was one thing then and one, it's another thing now. I, I do not understand why I am reading more of that. It has to be related to grievance culture, identity politics. It has to be related to that. What would cause an otherwise normal adult to write such things? The kind of things that in the 1970s and 80s would have torpedoed your career. Would have made sure that you were, that you were in the same part of the bookstore as Eric Von Daniken. Uh, instead, now it's common. Now, if you get a new, uh, a history of mysticism, a history of the mystic arts, you will not, odds are, you will not be reading a cultural history of how this was viewed by the church, by laymen, what, how it was paid for, what the books that it generated were. You'll instead be reading about it. You'll be reading a history of the mystic arts. Here's what they were then. Here's what they were a century later. Here's what they, uh, they, they looked to be in the age of the Enlightenment when they didn't exist. You have to write a history of them as a cultural phenomenon. You can't write a history of them as if they were real. Uh, maybe I'm not drawing that distinction. <laughs> but, uh, but believe it or not, although I sound irritated, this is not cracking the serenity of this day. This is the kind of stuff that I like. Uh, if, if Violet Muller is, is actually writing a book in which isn't it a shame that we that we have been so systematically prejudiced, so institutionally prejudiced against alchemists and witches? Well, if Violet Muller, despite her previous books and despite her education as a historian, is writing a book like that, then although that fact irritates me because it is adding to a 21st century society that just willfully does not want to know what is real, uh, I will still get a great deal of pleasure out of clamping one leg up here another leg of the book up here two legs wide apart down there and then tearing apart the guts of it <laughs> just ripping the guts out just tearing them out streaming them all over the place stringing them up from the rafters while the book screams in agony i will get a great deal of happiness out of doing that so so it all bounces out it's all cosmic man <laughs> Well, let's see this other package here, which has a good deal of handwriting on it. So this could be from one of you. Uh, the reason that I squint when I say that is because of rule number one on this channel, uh, which is don't send me a book. If I know it seems natural, but don't send me a book unless you are absolutely sure I want it. And the way to oh, the way to do that is to ask me. Uh, even though that seems like uh, it ruins the surprise. Uh, uh, let's see here. Oh, isn't that nice? Okay, there's a note from the sender. Uh, how wonderful. Uh, this is the... I've had this a couple of times. I keep sending it out. I keep sending it to other people. Now I have it again. Uh, fantastic. One of you in the UK found a uh, dirt cheap uh, hardcover copy of The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel. Big, thick thing with a built-in bookmark and these, these lovely watery end papers uh, and sent it along. <laughs> so thank you very, very much. This has uh, an Oxfam sticker on it, three pounds. Fantastic. I would have bought that. I have never been in an Oxfam shop. Uh, I imagine I, I've been in many, many of the, the U.S. equivalents of them, but... 
uh, still the wonders <laughs> that I'm sure that you see every day that I don't ever get to see. Uh, because, of course, in the UK, UK trade paperbacks are just called trade paperbacks. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, this I've had this before. This this uh, this edition of the Mirror and the Light has shown up in uh, various sale lots here in the United States, in Ollies and whatnot. Uh, this is the UK edition. I'm pretty sure that the, the that the version that showed up in the in those sale lots here in the United States was not. This is what Faber, fourth, their fourth estate. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the hardcovers that showed up in the u.s where u.s printed and this is not so now i have this again as a hardcover this is uh uh very much appreciated if you're watching very much appreciated i will send an email uh but this is in a way it dovetails with a reading project that we did just recently on this channel we read through ch part by part of um bring up the bodies by hillary mantel the second book in this series this is the third and final book uh when we were doing that bring up the bodies read along i was thinking and saying out loud that what i should do when i'm done with it is jump backwards and read wolf hall again the first book in the series uh and one of the most famous historical novels of the 21st century but i really the more i think about that the more i think i really don't need to do that it was just last year that we went through wolf hall for the steve tiberius donahue book club which is essentially what these chapter-by-chapter read-throughs are. I should just rename them that. I should just revive the Steve W.S. Donahue Book Club, except that they're somewhat ad hoc. They don't, I don't usually announce ahead of time. Uh, nevertheless, I don't think any of you would care, and that would be fun to rename it that, to revive the Steve W.S. Donahue Book Club. But I just did Wolf Hall last year. Uh, I'm not sure that I have anything substantially different to say about it. Whereas The Mirror and the Light? No. So I think that we should do The Mirror and the Light next. Now that we've done the Bring Up the Bodies, we should do The Mirror and the Light next, and then Joshua Crabo can make a playlist of Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies and The Mirror and the Light, and you'll have the whole thing there. Uh, since I can't be bothered to learn how to do it myself. <laughs> someday. Someday Joshua will come here for Wine and Calzones, and I will pay him back <laughs> with endless John Wayne clips. <laughs> I don't think is fair. <laughs> what do I care? <laughs> Uh, so I'm strongly thinking about that. I was thinking about doing Wolf Hall again, but it seems seems like overkill to do it, you know, just a few months after I did it before. So maybe this next, now that I have this lovely hardcover sent to me by one of you. How wonderful. Uh, great. Okay, well, this has all the UK blurbs on it for, for uh, Wolf Hall and, and Bring Up the Bodies. Uh, but this is wonderful. Fantastic. So I'll have to alert, uh, I think Zach at the Brattle is looking for a copy of this for me. I'll have, to, I'll have to alert him that I already have it. Maybe get him to put a covering on it the way he did the first two. Uh, but anyway, that is the mail. Bring up uh, the Mirror and the Light, which is wonderful. It is absolutely wonderful. It is brutally sad. Just brutally sad. Uh, but wonderful. Uh, and then we have two historical science books. Uh, inside the stargazer's palace uh and dark brilliance really dovetailing each other from pegasus that's great uh so that is that is the mail uh for today as far as has happened today saturdays are a little off the normal delivery people aren't, don't work on the weekends so the their substitutes deliver whenever they want so i don't know that i've got everything that i'm going to get today but i'm not going to worry about it everything's blissfully quiet no one wants me to heat up their tuna fish sandwich no one wants me to hold a nail for them or hold a ladder for them or let them in when they lock themselves out or eye something to see if it's level or call their nephew to get a translation of what they want to ask me no one is asking for my time at all except well actually nobody <laughs> you are but otherwise no even editors aren't around on the weekend so, so this is exactly what i was hoping today would be like it's bright, it's beautiful, it's calm, it's clear. It's the end of the world because it's a full 50 degrees warmer than it should be. Uh, but nothing I can do about that. And it is, I admit, nice in a, in, a, in a pleasant kind of way to walk around in just a shirt, to just, w whether it's early morning, afternoon, whether it's evening, whether it's nighttime, I don't need to think anymore when the bean and I are getting ready to go outside. I don't need to think anymore. Well, you know, what's it like outside? Should I put on gloves should i put on a hat or anything like that i don't have to think about that anymore i just we just i put on shoes and we go out uh and just walk around you're not gonna get you're not gonna get cold 
you might overheat. Our, our late our late morning walk today, we overheated <laughs> on on October twenty sixth in Boston. So, uh, but uh, apart from that, and that itself is lovely. It's just thinking about that that is not lovely. Uh, but apart from that, the day has been wonderful. The night was wonderful, full of reading, and the day has been wonderful, full of reading. So, so if you were worried, you need worry no more. <laughs> so I will wrap this up, and I'll be back. Thank you, Bertie.